Hey everyone, it's Rob and thanks for listening in today. As always, I greatly appreciate your time. My guest today is Jay Steinfeld. Now Jay founded and was the CEO of Blinds.com. It was the world's number one online window covering retailer. He bootstrapped it in 1996 for just $3,000 from his Bel Air, Texas garage. Later, Blinds.com was acquired by the Home Depot in 2014. Now, Jay remind, remained as its CEO and later joined the Home Depot online leadership team. After stepping away from these roles early in 2020, he now teaches entrepreneurship at Rice University's Jones Graduate School of Business, and he has increased his involvement on numerous private company boards and serves as a director of the public company, Masonite. He also supports numerous charities. Jay is an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and has earned a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Houston Technology Center. Active as an industry speaker on topics including corporate culture, core values, how to scale a startup, and disruption, he has more than 100 published articles and writes a column for Inc.com. He also sings in the same barbershop quartet of which he's been a part of for nearly 50 years. <laughs> he lives with his wife, Barbara, in Houston, Texas, and has five children and seven grandchildren, whom he proudly refers to as his seven startups. Jay's book, Lead from the Core, the Four Principles for Profit and Prosperity is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Of course, it's available for purchase at all the usual places, including Amazon. Now, you can visit Jay and actually download the first chapter for free at his website, jsteinfeld.com. That's spelled J-A-Y-S-T-I-N-F-E-L-D.com. And of course, that'll be in the show notes. And let me tell you, Jay is such a great guy, and you will pick up on that very quickly during our conversation. So please enjoy. Jay, it's so great to see you. Thanks for joining me. This is the greatest. <laughs> we don't this know the that greatest. yet. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's how I know. That's how Thank I know it's wrong. the greatest. That Thank answer is how I know. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we got introduced by a mutual friend and I just couldn't be happier. The second I met you prior to us uh, chatting today, I knew what a great energy you had, what a special person you you are. And so I'm just really excited to, to talk to you and um, maybe you'll share a few uh, nuggets of wisdom with, with the people listening. I have a feeling you will. Now, I always like to start with a quote and this one goes like this. I know you believe in me, don't worry. I won't let you down. Uh, and that's actually a quote from you yeah. as you drove down a narrow cemetery road looking back at your mother's grave. Right. And I hate to go right into this kind of conversation. Yeah. Hopefully it's okay with you. But what comes to mind when you hear that? Well, I can still envision being in that car driving away from, from my mom's mm -hmm. grave. Mm -hmm. It's vivid. And I've been, I, and that happened a long time ago. That was in, in 1977, uh, I had, I was just in my freshman year of college, so it was it was obviously very sad for me. My my, my um, mom died of ovarian cancer at the age of 46, so that's young. My wife died of breast cancer at the age of 47, so I've lost the two most important women in my life to cancer at almost the same age in the same time of life. And what, what it occurs to me is how those types of things affected my sense of time, understanding the fragility of time and how important it is to maybe escape the types of things that normally get in the way of getting something done where you just have to appreciate everything that's good and discard the bad, mm. but not really say it didn't happen, that it, they both happen. 
I, I think about, you know, am I a, uh, an optimist or a pessimist? I'm both. When you say the, the, is the glass half full or half empty, it is both half full and half empty. So it's this idea of accepting both things at the same time. And in the case of my mother's death and my wife's death, I had a great relationship with my mother and with my wife. And I was married almost 25 years. And it was brutally sad when they died. But I don't try to say, well, I shouldn't be sad. I will forever be sad. And when you can take that sadness and the happiness and the joy that exists anyway, both at the same time and not say it needs to be binary, mm -hmm. one or the other. Well, that's what I think of when I think of that, that time of my, of my mom. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a point where, you know, after your mom passed away and then later when your wife passed away at almost a similar age, was there ever, did you ever think to yourself, how is that possible that they were both so close in age? What's happening here? In other words, what, you know, is there like some in type a big of, way, yeah. 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 No, I've, yeah. I've, 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 it's never even occurred to me. Mm. You're the first person that's, that's ever asked me that question. It's an interesting question. That type of, of thought, though, what, what occurred to me when you said that, Rob, is that people's lives are determined for them, that there's some energy around there and that you're the victim and that it doesn't matter what you do, that mm. there's just something going on that you have no control of. That's the opposite of how I think. I realize that there's luck, there's definitely luck, and there are things that you cannot control. There's a lot of things you can't control, but you can control your life to, to a large degree. And to say that something's happening that, that is beyond, is, is just too fatalistic. And I, I believe as an entrepreneur that you determine your own fate. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, I, I was lucky at many times in, in the trajectory of my life and my business and a lot of good things happen, but there's a lot of bad stuff too. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I think it, everything yeah. works out and it goes back to what I said at the beginning. You think of the sadness, you think of the happiness and you, you control what you can. Yeah. Thank you for that. Now, two books that you write about that have been very influential to you are Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl and The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. I want to start by Man's Search for Meaning and the impact it had on you. You have this list in your book um, of books and that one just happens to be listed first. And I was trying to determine if there was any reason, it was that intentional because they didn't seem to be in alphabetical order. So. Was that listed first intentionally? And if so, why? And if not, that's okay. And then what has the book meant to you? As I'm thinking about that, to really try to answer that honestly, I don't think I intentionally put it first, but I think subconsciously I did. I think because everything starts with purpose and everything starts with vision and what viscerally is important to you and introspection, and that book is about introspection. It's about silver linings that, that, that you find in almost anything, even, even when you're in a concentration camp. So it probably was at the top of the list because purpose and values are so important to me that it had to, it had to rise to the top. Mm -hmm. When did you realize that in your life, that that was so important to you? I think it started occurring to me when my mother died, mm. but it wasn't conscious because it wasn't until I was thinking after my wife died in 2002 that I needed to figure out just what makes me tick. What is, what is it all about? What do I, can I even be happy again? Mm -hmm. How do I define happiness? How do I define success? So to do that, my go-to is to start researching and to learn from others. So I started reading other people's philosophy and read really one of the potentially greatest books on that of all time, 
man's search for meaning. Yeah. So that was just the beginning of it. There were other books like um, Built to Last from Jim Collins, but that's a business book. And yeah, it's about purpose and all that, but not as visceral right. as, as Man's Search for Meaning. So it, it was probably right after my wife died when I was, I needed to, to determine this. This was not something I just wanted to do because, hey, if you're running a business, you should understand core values. You should understand vision. Uh, there's TED Talks on, on vision and purpose and all that. No, this is something I needed to do because I needed to live. Mm -hmm. I needed to be happy. I didn't want to be depressed. How do I raise my three children? Should I continue with my business? What should I do? So I did what you needed to do, and that is start learning. Mm -hmm. Learning about myself and learning about what others have done in similar situations. Mm. How did the happiness hypothesis affect you in your life? I think the, the number one thing in, in that book mm -hmm. was the, there's a, I think an Indian proverb about riding an elephant where you think you can drive an elephant. Mm -hmm. And I actually have done that. I went, I went to uh, Thailand and we, we rode elephants in, uh, in rivers and up hills. It was crazy. And you, you, you pull on the ears and you, you, you think you want to go right. You pull on the, the right ear a little bit and but no, the elephant's going to go where it wants to go. Uh -huh. And you think you control. And that's the same thing with your brain and your mind. So much of what you think you're controlling is conscious, but it's all subconscious. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that you realize you're, you're really, it's, it's mystifying sometimes because you think you know what you're doing, but you're really not. There's yeah. just so many things that are happening subconsciously that you don't realize in, in decision making, in making what you think is a logical decision, but it's based on some old recipe of yours mm -hmm. in your brain and how you were brought up. And there's all sorts of things um, that, that happen that cloud your decision making. So I think that's what that did. It yeah. also defined happiness. So just another one of the books along the way that, mm -hmm. that helped me start thinking about it consciously and deliberatively. Did you have people in your life that were, that you had surrounded yourself with, or uh, whether it be in business or outside of business that were recommending these kinds of things for you? Or were you searching and you'd see, oh, this sounds good, the happiness hypothesis, or I read about this and da, da, da. You know, I think I'm gonna investigate this a little bit more because you were just on a journey. I was just on a journey mm -hmm. and I just, that's just what I do. Got it. When I, when I get to a topic, and there's a lot of topics I don't know anything about, but I want to learn and I want to feel like I'm, I'm at least reasonable at it. So I start reading as much as I can. It's one of the things in business that I used, that I did all the time. If I'm thinking about branding, I would just start reading books and articles on branding. Pretty soon they all started sounding alike, but I got a better concept about branding, mm -hmm. about or scaling an organization, about hiring all the usual topics that all entrepreneurs have. And that's just what I do. Mm -hmm. This just happened to be one of the more important topics about my life and whether I could be happy again and how, how I should think about raising my, my three children. Mm -hmm. So that, that was just the, an ordinary, this is my, my method of, of operation. Yeah. You're a lifelong learner. Do you still yeah. learn like that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I had a, a, a COO that, that I, he told me he was an expert. And my answer was that Henry Ford, when he was told that there was an expert, that the person thought of him, the other person as an expert, he fired him. <laughs> and, and he thought I was going to fire him. I said, are you firing me? I said, no, I just want you to know that no matter how much you know, you're never going to know as much as you need to know. And I think that's an important lesson, too. It if is. you believe you already know everything or even know enough today, mm -hmm. it's not going to be enough tomorrow. Yeah, you, you have, actually have, you have you a have quote in the book learning. about that. You have a quote in the book about that. Um, I'll come to that later. Okay. I, I, I noticed that Peter, Peter Diamandis uh, was one of the people to endorse your book. And um, which, by the way, I just want to hold it up for our YouTube I know you have it behind you, but it's a, it really is a great book. And thank you for sharing, um, you know, your personal stories in there. 
because I think you bring together, you know, what you did in business, which is great. It's fantastic. But when you get to know the person, the way you allow the reader to get to know the person, it just really raises it up a level. It makes it extra special. And, and um, I could really feel into you while I was reading it. So, Thank but I, back to Peter Diamandis, I, I, I saw that you're uh, part of the XPRIZE Innovation Board. And I'm curious, how did you get to know Peter and how has he impacted your thinking in this world? And as it relates to the board, is there anything mind blowing that you're learning right now about what's going on out there? Okay, so I knew that at some point I was going to leave blinds.com after selling it to Home Depot. And so I was thinking, so what are some, you know, I was disruptive. I disrupted the blinds industry. I like disruption, I guess. I like to do things that have never <laughs> been done that are kind of far fetched. Well, Peter Diamandis, that's all he does. Is, <laughs> And he surrounds himself with Elon Musk and Larry Page and Eric Schmidt and all these people who do things that other people just can't even think of doing, but they actually do them. Mm -hmm. So I thought I, I need to I need to be introduced to Peter and figure out how I can be involved in X Prize. And that was simple as that. This was going to be part of my uh, not retirement, but rewirement yeah. so that I would do just continue to expand my thoughts and who better than with, with Peter. So I got on that, on that board. I'm not on it anymore, but I was there, I think six years. Mm. And that was great. Being at his conferences and just listening to him and being surrounded by these brilliant people. I mean, I think I did something by disrupting, disrupting the blinds industry and <laughs> sold it to Home Depot, which is formidable. But it's nothing compared to what they did. I mean, they are literally solving, you know, using stem cells and they're going to Mars and, and, and finding water out of a rock, things like that, things that actually matter. Yeah. <laughs> what I did matters to people in their lives because, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we gave a lot of people a really good living. Right. And we all felt really good about it. But being with Peter Diamandis and his crew, is, yeah. a, is another step. Yeah. That's How why did, I did it. And so was it more just, was it inspirational? Did that work? Was that what it kind of did for you? It was just like, okay, I disrupted blinds, but whoa, like, don't get so comfortable. There's a lot of work to do out there. Yes, there's exactly. a lot of just, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of poor people. There's a lot of people without water. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people without food. Yeah. Uh, there's climate change. There's all these things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a way to solve these things. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there really is a way to do this. Yeah. So let's, let's not accept things the way they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm on a board called Hand in Hand, which is based in, in Israel. It's basically about bringing Jews and Arabs together and maybe solving peace in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going to do that, but it's right. working towards it. It's lighting a candle in the darkness for right. sure. Right. And it's, it's, so those are the kinds of things I like to do, the, the improbable things because if you even get halfway there, you can feel like you made a contribution yeah. at least. Yeah. And feel like you're still meaningful, that you still have some role in, in life. That's right. Reasons to live. Mm -hmm. Did he in any way, or maybe you felt this way before, did he um, affect the way you, in your news input by chance? My how you input? yeah your news like did did you watch less news after you got to know what he was all about or do you watch the same or read news or whatever I, or maybe you didn't that, do any of it i don't know that my news input but i had some additional input mm -hmm. from his newsletters and his books mm -hmm. bold is a great book i i, I read bold i love mm -hmm. that one yeah and some of the conferences that he had we met amazing people yeah i mean you you just in awe of the people that he knows mm -hmm. and him yeah. so it was it was great to be around people that would elevate your perspective on what might be and what they were doing that caused you to have that incentive that motivation that yes maybe together we can do these things we can collaborate we can literally change the world right we can change civilization for the better yeah it's so true. You know, I mean, I mean, I know Elon Musk gets all the news, 
But it is remarkable, you know, when he says we're going to have a rocket come and land and we'll reuse it. And everyone goes, you're crazy. Like, what are you wasting your time doing? Those yeah. kinds of things. Like, right. it actually can happen. It can. Yes. All it takes is one person then to bring it all together, a bunch of really, really smart people or yeah. whatever. It, it is amazing. All those um, things are impossible until they're not. That's right. Yeah. And then it's commonplace or something. Right. Um, I thought this was interesting. At one point, you were ranked as one of the top 60 CEOs on social media. And I was curious, what were you doing that people were, were noticing at that time? And was it useful? Well, the, the, <laughs> was it useful? It, you know, you, anything that you do towards getting better and understanding communication is useful. Whether you, you use it for good or not, I, mean, I wasn't trying to become anything. <laughs> I just knew that social media was emerging and this was very early. And rather than read about social media, I wanted to do it. So that's really, that was my motivation. Mm. As they say, if you want to learn about gorillas, you got to go to the jungle. You can't read it in the book. <laughs> so I went into the Twitter jungle and flew around. So that, that's really all that was. And it was useful because I was able to make connections with people. It, it got me speaking engagements all around the country. Um, a bunch of those. Uh, I think it was because of that, I, somebody from Inc. Magazine asked me to do an article and then they asked me to write for Inc. Magazine. Mm -hmm. So it's making your own luck. Yeah. You yeah know, luck is right. not just things that just happen. You can do mm -hmm. things that increase your luck. Mm -hmm. And those that was an increase of luck type of an activity. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? And then were you, were you this, what kind of social media person were you? Were you a noticer or were you just said, were you a motivator? You know, what, what was your kind of, how did you handle? I was a noticer. A noticer. I, was I, a, I, I had a feeling about that. I was a noticer. Like, I mean, I think what I would I would use it for is uh, okay. Here's here's something I noticed. I, I I'm driving down the street and, and a little kid's got a lemonade stand on the side, and I noticed his sign sucked. He needed a better sign. <laughs> <laughs> I I pulled over the side of the road and helped him create a better sign so oh he would God. sell more lemonade. <laughs> That's so great. And I wrote about that on Twitter. That is so great. How long I actually ago was noticed that? the same thing when I went to, this is going to sound crazy, but I was there with my wife in Amsterdam and we went to the red light district and noticed that the, the, the prostitutes weren't providing eye contact and they weren't yeah. actually looking out their windows. I felt they could do a better job too. <laughs> and wrote an you about article sales. for Inc. about that. I'm just trying <laughs> to help... I'm just trying to help civilization. That's right. Oh, you know, I, I read that lemonade stand kid. He just raised fifty million dollars on a startup. So I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Th he thanks you for it. Exactly. Um, you mentioned a minute ago that you, and because you left uh, blinds.com slash Home Depot uh, in 2020. And you talk about that as being rewiring, not retiring. Yeah. Um, what does that mean to you? And for those that are doing something like that or getting near doing something like that, um, how can they use that kind of same philosophy? Well, I was uh, retirement to me meant folding, you know, folding up your tent, and going home and just fishing. I love fly fishing. I love fly fishing. I've fly fished around the world. But that's an activity that's active, it's doing, it's got targets, you learn the technique of it, all that kind of, I, and I want to learn more about it. I just started playing pickleball. I want to get good at it. So I'm watching video, you know, a lot of uh, <laughs> videos on it and looking at the lessons. So I want to get good at all, anything that I'm doing. So this is really what I, what I did as I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. I wanted to, well, first, become part of XPRIZE. Uh, start, I started teaching in the business school at Rice, which mm -hmm. is, I'm still doing that. Mm -hmm. I started writing the book. I started thinking and I started, I joined a very small local board because I knew I wanted to join boards. And now I'm on five. So 
before I'd even left blinds.com, I had set in motion the process for rewirement because it wasn't going to be this implosion. Mm -hmm. It was just going to be new. And my wife, of course, was very uh, uh, worried that, <laughs> wow, you're the CEO of blinds.com. You've got this giant company is doing great part of you're on the Home Depot leadership team. You're going to walk away from that and you're going to really be sad. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel your ego is going to be is just going to just evaporate and all this. No, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to do all these other things. And I think anyone who is thinking about selling their business, moving aside, think about anything. It doesn't have to be the perfect thing. Just start small. Just start being on small, a small local board. Be an advisor. Start advising startups. There's plenty of places where you can advise startups and just start doing that and eventually see if you like that. And if you do, do more of it. So that's that's really my, my it's, it's like uh, MVP, minimum viable product. I do that with my life. <laughs> I just start doing something small. And if I like it, I, I just rev it up. Mm -hmm. If not, I stop and try something else until it resonates. Was, was there an intuitiveness about that for you? Or were you doing your research and reading how are good ways to go about this? You know, how did that come about the, all this thought process for you? Well, I was reading about it, but this is just this is just what I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about as a, as a CEO, really the higher up you go in your, in your organization, the more you think about the future, your timeline just naturally goes beyond checking off things on a list. So I'm used to thinking five, 10 years out in the future. That's what the CEO does. You don't do things that you don't do any real work. Mm -hmm. You just think and let everyone else do the work. You that is the work. thing about do nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's my goal is to do nothing. <laughs> so I, I, I was actually talking to this really smart, funny guy who, who, who writes. And he said, boy, you really like to work hard. I said, no, I will work hard, but I'd rather do nothing. He thought that was <laughs> like that was hilarious. That's good. I mean, your goal is to do as little as possible and, and leverage what you're doing to great extent. So why yeah. would you want to work harder? You want to work less. Mm -hmm. So that's just what I would do. I would figure out what can I do down the road? What is the least amount I, I need to do now to have some feeling that I've got some purpose later in life? Yeah. So that's just what I did. And then how, at what point did you put a succession plan in place? Once I knew that, well, when you're in a big organization like Home Depot, succession mm -hmm. planning is discussed twice a year mm -hmm. for all key positions. So it was natural that I'd be thinking about that the whole time because okay. that's just what good companies do. Yeah. But for me, when I really thought about it was as I was getting closer to thinking, maybe it's time that I should be leaving. And one of the conditions I set for myself was I wasn't going to leave until I had approved, had gotten approval, ironclad approval of who my successor was going to be. Because when you build a company, you want to make sure it continues. You want to make sure you understand who's going to be holding the reins and who's going to be in control. So that was a very important condition for me before I would leave. There were things I also wanted to do to make sure those were done that I felt like only I could do. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to make sure that my core values were in place, ironclad, that everybody understood that this is what made the, the company tick. It wasn't me. And it wasn't because of me that the company was so great. It was because of what we together built. And once I knew that was happening, and then I had my, my next gig that I knew what I was going to do. <laughs> Once I knew all those things were happening, I knew it was time to go. And I felt really good. It wasn't like, damn, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. I knew exactly what I was going to do because I was already doing it. I was already teaching. I was already on a board. I was already living. It was a transition. It was like the relay race 
where one person's handing off the baton to the other in that zone mm -hmm. where it's yeah, allowed when you're both there. That's what I was doing with my rewirement. Yeah. And it was it was a very deliberate. How long did it take? About uh, two years. Two years. OK. Yeah. They wanted me to give them 18 months mm -hmm. notice. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about it two years in advance. But I knew that those were the things I needed to do. So as they got closer and closer and I, I realized, OK, so I'm going to do this. I need to have the successor. And then I would just work through the organization and make sure all the key people who I knew were involved at Home Depot in making that decision told me. And I went to each one of them to their face and asked them, so Steve is going to be the, my successor. Is, are you good with that? Yeah, yeah, it's Steve. OK. I wasn't going to just go to HR no. and go, yeah, HR, <laughs> Here's right. the guy. Yeah. HR does what the CEO wants to do mm -hmm. or the CFO or the, or the executive VPs. They're the ones that matter. Now, you, when you, when you all read the book, you will understand that this company, what it became, and then later as it got part of Home Depot, which is shiny and beautiful and wow. <laughs> it, it took a lot to get there. <laughs> Just put it that way. To keep it together. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, there was a lot in there, which was a great story. Um, but you included a quote in there. It's our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed always is to try just one more time. That's from Thomas Edison. And I'm curious for you, I got thinking about that, which it sounds logical to me, but as it relates to business, do you ever think there's actually a time to give up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about your retirement requirement. I'm talking yeah, that about that was the first thing that occurred to me, but then I realized no, that's not really the, the the answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are times where you try something and then you say, you know, maybe we can do this, maybe we can do this, but you have to then say, but there are so many other things we could do. Mm -hmm. There's so many other options for how to proceed let's try one of those others and maybe it'll be easier. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do it faster. Maybe it's gonna require less effort. Maybe what we thought was going to work actually isn't the best option anyway. So there, you get to the point where you just keep banging your head against the wall and you look at the blood down there and you go, <laughs> you know, maybe it's time that I shouldn't be bleeding anymore. I don't know what, exactly how to make that decision Yeah, because there's also so much in business that is not binary. It just takes some intuition. And yes, mm. you do look at data, but the data could say, uh, Rob, it's time that this is not working, but, and you go, well, I'm just gonna keep trying it. Well, that's ridiculous too, because if you keep trying the same thing over and over, that's insanity, right? Right, yeah. So no, uh, I think there are plenty of times where you just, you, in fact, you try to give up quite early mm -hmm. because if it doesn't work, you just try something else. Yeah. And that's, that's fine too. Yeah. Because you really never know when you set out to do anything, whether it's going to work. Right. Or if that's you do know, then you're really not experimenting enough because you're being too safe and you'll really never get anything done of any great magnitude unless you really start experimenting and trying things totally outside your comfort zone mm -hmm. and totally not knowing whether it's going to work. Which is one of your values. What you have these four E's. Yes. One of the core values was experiment. Uh, it was okay to fail. Experiment, if you experiment without fear of failure. Without fail, yeah, without fear of failure. Yeah. So, you know, how, how did that is, I think, is such a, an important aspect of a company culture. So, one of the things I was thinking a little bit about and a little bit of just drawing on my own experiences is <clears throat> when you're so busy in the day to day. And, and you're, say you're not at the CEO level or maybe even the leadership team level, and this is your value, and you're trying to figure out, like, I'm just trying to get my job done. What, what, do I, what do I have time to experiment on? How did you cultivate that throughout the organization? Well, it's, it's some, that value is something that I do, mm -hmm. but I'm also risk averse. So I don't <laughs> want to make it seem like you just see if you, I'm going to jump off a building 
and see experiment and see if I can fly. No, I'm not going to do that. Right. There's a lot of things to fear when you experiment. Mm -hmm. I just take a lot of small, do a lot of small experiments. Mm -hmm. And if they start working, like we were talking about before, I start revving it up. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. just what I do. I do a lot of little experiments. But what about your team? You know, because I'm thinking about how you disseminate these values amongst the team. So I can really relate to it and understand it at your level. But I'm trying to think about maybe somebody who's part of the finance team or something like that. And they're just yeah. trying to, you know, you follow? They're, yeah, they're just trying to get stuff done. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Don't, don't tell me about experiment without fear of failure. I've got to close the books in That's three right. days. Yeah. Yes. And there are certain jobs like that where you don't experiment. Okay. If you are operating on somebody, you don't, hey, you know, let's see if we can cut this vein <laughs> instead and see if it doesn't bleed. No, you don't experiment like that. Yeah. There's some things where you don't experiment without fear. Good, good. Thank you for that clarification. So it's, it's not an open-ended thing. You, you get people to experiment by telling them it's okay to experiment and showing your own willingness to experiment mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to show somebody that it matters is by modeling it yourself yeah. and how you react to other people when they do it. If they try something and it doesn't work and you go, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> right. Come on, we've got these books in it. And you just yell at them. Well, they'll never experiment again. And no one else will experiment. So you, how, what you model, what you do, and how you react to other people is so mm -hmm. important. Yeah. It's, the, it's not what you write as your core values. It's actually your behavior. Yeah. So you get people to experiment by experimenting and by saying, what have you, what have you experimented on lately? Tell me about some things that didn't work. What'd you learn from it? We interview people about those who, who have not only just a willingness to experiment, but have a propensity and a, a, a fun zest for experimentation. And during the interview process, we ask, tell me about some things you're doing right now in your personal life to experiment. And if they go, well, I'm, I just went to, uh, to Asia with a backpack and no itinerary. That's an experiment. Mm -hmm. I love an answer like that. That we, Now, if they said, I, I decided I'm going to go up in an airplane with no flying lessons and see if I can fly. <laughs> no, that was a stupid experiment. That's, that's, that's not good. That's not experiment without fear of failure. That's right. stupidity. Mm -hmm. So you, you're looking for people who are already like that, for one. So you've already got a culture of people who are inclined to want to experiment and to have fun and to do all the other core values that we have. And then you reinforce it and you keep talking about it and you let people know, wow, this is where Rob just experimented on something and it didn't work, but it's okay because now we found this to work. And they go, wow, he really means that. Mm -hmm. I guess it is safe to experiment at blinds.com. Yeah. I guess I can try to learn something that I've never really thought I was capable of doing. When he says, let's experiment, I want you to express yourself and someone expresses yourself and you as a leader say to the entire organization in an all hands meeting, Rob, you are new to the organization. This is your second day and you're already speaking up. You're really going to go far here. And I appreciate that. If you say things like that, because I really meant it when I said things like that, I really do want people to speak up. I really do want people to experiment. And I would genuinely reinforce that type of behavior in front of everybody else. It's not just uh, not enough just right. to go to that person and say, hey, really good job. I really appreciate you speaking up in the meeting today, especially since you've only been here two days. Let everybody know. And eventually, uh, people would hear these things about us when they start interviewing. And they'd look around and they'd see people smiling and happening. Our turnover rate was 8%. It was amazing. And they wouldn't think it was real. And they'd say like six months later, a year later, this stuff actually is happening. <laughs> I did not think that the organist, I thought you were putting on a show for me, <laughs> but you really do mean it. And that's the thing. It's culture and these values mm -hmm. are not about just stipulating it as something that you must do, but you actually do do it and you reinforce it, you encourage it, 
you tell people and it it makes a gigantic difference when people mm-hmm. see it as being authentic. Yeah. You mentioned your turnover rate was 8%. I actually had a question about that. I, I you know, I've, I've spoken with other entrepreneurs who have a philosophy around low turnover rates actually being a negative thing. Um, and I would love, I was so curious to get your take on that, especially given that you had such a low turnover rate. Well, I, I look, any strength when taken to an extreme is a weakness. Mm. If you're really good attention to detail and every detail has to be perfect and you're a perfectionist, well, you'll never get anything done. So the same thing is with, with turnover. So it's true. Actually, at the be- earlier in my career, our turnover rate was even lower yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was because we weren't exacting uh, minimum acceptable performance standards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we weren't telling people, we weren't elevating where the organization and the people needed to be at increasingly higher and higher levels. And if you don't do that, your turnover rate will be low. Well, we were doing that and we eventually got it up mm. to 8%. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, great. <laughs> so it was, but people would also, uh, we were so intent on our, our, our values. And because the interview process was so keen on that, it was not that often that people were not already geared towards wanting to evolve and experiment and express mm-hmm. themselves and have fun yeah. our four core core values yeah. they they like that i don't know if this correlates but you wrote uh something in the book that just made me laugh out loud you write <laughs> leadership does not mean being chicken shit what do yeah. you mean by that <laughs> <laughs> um yeah leadership is not chicken shit what what that what that means is you have to not be afraid to tell people bad, bad things that are happening. You can't chicken out and telling people the truth. I believe that quote was when a, when I got fired from my Nikki discount mufflers. Yeah, I was fired. <laughs> that was a sad day and a happy day. <laughs> good story. It's a good and, story. You got to read it. It's a good story. Yeah, it's a, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but yeah. the, my, my, my boss didn't have the nerve to actually fire me himself. He had a lieutenant that I didn't even talk to. I ne- never even hardly spoke to him. I had his lieutenant do it. Well, that's chicken shit. That's, <laughs> if, if, if you, there's some news, you should tell the news. Because if, if you've got some news about um, the economy, about retention, about supply chain, about COVID, anything that's happening that you're seeing as a leader and you don't tell people about it, you're lying to them and they won't trust you because you're withholding information. Now you don't tell people everything, but being chicken shit is being afraid of telling people the truth and afraid of having candor. It also applies to personal development. If you've got an employee and they're not living up to expectations, well, why not? What are they not doing? And what can you, you're going to be dishonest and it's unfair to them if you don't tell them directly what is wrong and what needs to happen or that you have to make a change. Yeah. So it's really just about, I don't know, I think it's more about not candor, but respect. Yeah. If you want things to get done, then you need good data and you can't expect somebody to change unless you tell them where they need to change. That's right. And if you're going to fire somebody, do it yourself. Come on. (laughs) Come on is right. It wouldn't have made it. It wouldn't have made it any better for me. (laughs) Well, it's a great lesson, I guess, that you could carry through and never do that to anyone else. Yeah. So as it relates to to being open and honest, um, when you uh, had to go through the process of selling your business, which I went through this as well, and um, and. I unfortunately was not able to share what was going on with their team, which was ripping me apart on the inside. I'm curious to know how it was for you. And then when you came out to make the announcement, which you write about, um, I'm just curious about, A, how you were feeling during the whole process and when you went to go in front of the team, and then what the response was 
from them. You know, their genuine response, you know, was fearful or were they excited or a little bit of everything or whatever. So well, that's a that's a pretty broad question. <laughs> and I'm thinking about the different types of people that yeah. I was talking to and the order in which, I mean, there's a whole way of thinking through that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. First, when you're selling a company, there are people that have to know because they're That's the right. ones that have to provide the diligence, that have to provide the information to prospective buyers or investment bankers or yeah. whomever it is. You can't do it by yourself. So you have to bring in your top people, which means and because we knew one day we would sell the company, I made sure that everybody had stock options. The entire comp company had stock options and that they vested on a change of control, which Good meant you. if you sell the company, everybody's stock would have value. I also gave the, the top people additional incentives, which I won't go into now, yeah. that were um, material. Yeah. And they would benefit in that event because here they are helping me build a business that would be unfair and why would they have any incentive right. to help me do it without me showing my appreciation and respect for them and it would just be it would just be blatantly unfair i couldn't do that mm -hmm. so I, th I think when when you're having a business whether you're thinking of selling if you think there's any possibility you need to be thinking about the compensation and how those people will benefit whenever you may sell the company and that should be in place they're going to feel better about working hard for you and for the business because they they know you're respecting them and you're not just saying well who cares mm. i'm curious at any time did you think about or consider an esop an employee stock ownership plan or anything like that it was a consideration but maybe for 10 seconds <laughs> 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 that's great <laughs> no I, i've heard horror stories about those and, okay okay that's oh, good. That, i mean we had a good team it was being run really well we were making a lot of money we were growing 25 we didn't need to do that yeah yeah it wasn't okay. a democracy I uh, mean, as, as the ceo i mean you basically can make every decision now mm -hmm. you shouldn't mm -hmm. but i did not want to give that up mm -hmm. it was my yeah. company yeah, now, as a, as a practical matter, though, I did for the, take in some investors early, their minority, and then after, I don't know, 12 years plus, I can't remember exactly, 2001, 2013 years, I did take in institutional capital. And once you take an in institutional capital, yeah. now you've got, yeah. it's a whole new story. Yeah. Now you know you're going to sell at some point because they wouldn't do it unless they were going to sell it. Yeah. And you've got some governance and you've got a real board and, and you basically cannot make all the decisions now. You're, you could be fired. The board, which you don't control now, could fire you. Yeah. And that's another thing. That's you, you think about, wait a minute, you can't do that. I started this, this is my company. <laughs> well, they can. That's right. <laughs> Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about this before. Uh, there's this quote that you included at the beginning of a chapter on readying yourself and your team for the in inevitable disruptions and stress that come with business. And the quote goes like this, beginners get excited when they know the answer, masters get excited when they don't. And that's a quote from Joel Marsh. Um, so what I wanted to ask you about are, what are some tips that you have that come to mind for you about managing stress? Well, first, let's just be clear that if you went into work every day and you did the same thing every day, it's time to get another job. <laughs> that's boring. That's stagnation. That's not growing. So the only way you can really motivate yourself is by having um, the unknown ahead of you. That's what's exciting. It's not say, having, okay, we've got a target and we're gonna march towards that target. I get having uh, goals, smart goals, working with objectives, OKRs, all that kind of stuff. But really thinking, we don't know how big this can be. We have no idea and we don't know what's going to be in our way. We're going to think real hard about it. That's fun. 
It's fun <laughs> not to know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know. I want to be able, I want to be oh, able to so think good. about all the things that may be and then think of more and then get a whole team of people together and say, this is what I've thought of. I know you can think of even more. What are some other things we could do? What are some other experiments that we could do that I'm not thinking of? Where do we need to experiment? Because I don't even know there's a problem. Where do you want to experiment? What would be fun for you? What do you want to find out? So uh, even when you hire people, do you need to know this person's going to be with you for 20 years? No, if you get two good years out of them and then they, they leave, that's awesome too, yeah. especially if you find out what they want to do. So it's, it's not just what you want to do and knowing what you're going to do. You don't even know what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So you ask and you say, hey, Rob, uh, we're doing our one-to-one -one now. And, uh, do you want to be here next year? What do you want to do? You want to start your own company? You want to go out and be an SVP somewhere? What do you want to do? And I'll help you get there, whether it's here or somewhere else. So you're helping people also get somewhere else. And now you're lifting everybody, not necessarily for the common good of this organization, but for the common good of all the people. And that was, that's what we did. Mm. So not really knowing what a person is going to amount to, what you're going to amount to, and especially not knowing what you can amount to. That's actually the coolest thing. How good can I be? How, what capacity do I have? I want to test myself and find out how good can this company be? What can we accomplish that no one's even thought of? Let's get a lot of data. Let's think about it. How can we make this fun? One of my four E's is to enjoy the ride. Mm -hmm. Enjoying the ride is not about selling your company to Home Depot. It, although that was fun. <laughs> that was very fun. Let me make no, no mistake about it. That was super fun. But those things happen like once in a lifetime. What's really fun is to think about what could be and working as a team and seeing if we can pull it off yeah. or pull off something else and whatever happens and letting people know, this gets back to an earlier question. I don't know if this is gonna work. We're gonna make an experiment. And if it doesn't work, well, we gave it a try. We thought it was, could work. Yeah. And that to me, it's, that's just part of the joy of business. It is. Of learning what capacity you have as an individual, how you can increase the capacity of your people, and how you can build teams to create even more leverage and capacity than you could by yourself or with any single individual. Mm -hmm. That is when people say, What is your greatest achievement? And what's your what's your what's the best thing that you've ever done? It's created teams that did things far beyond anything I believed I could ever do. Mm. The, our, the purpose of the, and that's how I learned about really what our purpose of the whole company is. And that's to help people become better than what they ever believed possible. Mm. Because I'm trying to see how good I can be. What am I possible of achieving? I don't know. <laughs> what are my limitations? Well, if I've got these limitations, Find somebody who can do it better. Learn. And I don't know, that, that's just that's the way I, I go about all of life. Yeah. Just trying to figure things out and seeing what is possible. Has your morning routine changed from the time when you were running the company since you left? Um, it has changed a little bit. I, I, I meditate. And for some reason, I've gotten out of my meditation um, <laughs> structure in the morning. I'm just, I don't know. It's because I have less to do. I'm doing less. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm, why I'm, I'm not having the discipline to do that mm -hmm. because it was automatic. Mm -hmm. It's like my workout, the taking vitamins, feeding the dog. I got this whole routine that I do in the morning, but somehow... I've left off meditation probably for the last six months or a year. Interesting. And occasionally I get back to it, but I, I haven't been able to figure out how to get, do it. And it was so good. <laughs> and I don't know why. I'm, I'm, I, maybe I'm just impatient. 
Well, I am impatient, but yeah. I'm impatient to a fault with that because I was doing it for years and years. Mm. I don't know. Well, you, sometimes <laughs> things call to us and the certain times of life they don't. Maybe they come back. Maybe they don't. You just, you never know what's possible and what's going to happen. Right, right, right. <laughs> And if I stress about it, that's the yeah, exact you opposite. You can't do that. Yeah, of what meditation that. is. That's exactly right. You shouldn't just, even be thinking about it. If it's going to happen, or it's going to happen. That's right. That's right. Good. Well, let's close on this because you just got back from a really big trip, and we were talking just briefly before we got on. You were in Africa, and you mentioned it was really life transformative. So, please share what was life transformative about that trip. Well, we were there, my wife and I went on a, uh, a private tour, the two of us, to mm. Southern Africa, uh, S South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, back to South Africa. And mm. anyone who goes, I mean, if you talk to anybody, they all say, wow, this has been the most amazing trip. And we've been in some great places. This was our number one trip by far. Number one, being two feet from a rhinoceros in itself should tell you it's a pretty cool trip. Seeing two lions eating a warthog oh. 20 feet away from you, yes. being at night with leopards on the prowl, walking down and hunting animals, seeing lions eating, um, I don't know what the animal was, it was hard to tell, with the hyenas and the vultures watching waiting for them to leave that's pretty cool mm -hmm. so you you can read about it you can you can watch the lion king and <laughs> yeah I'll tell you, there's, i told one of my granddaughters that we, we were in africa and there were some warthogs and she goes did they sing <laughs> That's great. That okay. is so good. No, the warthogs did not sing. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's so, and the people were mm. so gracious and so grateful that mm. we were there because COVID has basically stopped tourism mm. In, mm. In, in Africa. Yeah. And now it's coming back. So having those types of things, being out in the bush and seeing these, gl these glowing, intensely glowing suns mm. that were just lighting up the, the the skies in bright orange i got this great picture of about a hundred birds in silhouette in front of the sun mm. with just luck mm. like, oh that was such a great shot jeez so things like that so a couple of questions one is when you're seeing all this happening and your sets perceptions are you know they must just be sparking <laughs> and all of a sudden what you may have read about or seen in pictures or watched on tv is right right in front of you is there a sense of it does it feel surreal in a way it does feel surreal mm. it, it sometimes you, you think well, i'm gonna get scared there's a leopard <laughs> right behind the truck and <laughs> these are not enclosed trucks you're just totally out no mm. no top on them Jeez. and i'm seeing the leopard go around the back of the truck where my wife, Barbara is. And I'm thinking, there's gonna be a leopard two feet from Barbara. Mm. And I'm gonna just let her know, there's a leopard coming behind you. Don't freak out. And she sees it and goes, oh my God. <laughs> and yeah, that feels surreal. Looking at the two lions eating the warthog, that was pretty surreal. Watching a leopard um, up in a tree wanting to come down where another leopard was eating. And every time he started coming down the tree, that lion, that leopard would look up and growl at him and then he'd run back up in the tree. No, <laughs> you cannot have my food, leopard. I, this is my food. Mm. Watching things like that, pretty amazing. And it's not National Geographic. It's not Discovery right. Channel stuff. You're right there. And you're thinking, could they jump on the truck? Will this... Uh, there was a, a, a an elephant that did come right up to the truck and kind of nudged it a little bit. Like, that was a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> when you get back to the big city, you know, and it's all the hustle and bustle and all the stuff that, you know, we're wired to be around. Do you draw on these experiences since you've been back to the, to the awe of the nature and the animals and the way it all comes together and the energy of that? And, and like bring some perspective at all to 
Well, it's only been two weeks since we've okay. been back. Okay. But I will say this. Um, I had this nice camera and a big, big lens. And uh, every time you see a bird or you see anything, the, 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 you, it's like you're swiveling. Oh, I've got to get that bird in flight. I've got to get that vulture up in the tree. And I was driving in, uh, in Houston, where I live, and a bird flew by. And the first thing I thought is, I need my camera. <laughs> I said, no, I'm in Houston. I've seen that bird before. Yes. We don't need to take That's a picture right. of an Oriole or a Cardinal. I've seen that. We'll see a lot more. And I don't need a picture of it, for uh, sure. It's so good. It's so good. Well, Jay. It, it actually did happen. It did, right, right. Thank you, Jay, for taking time to chat with me. You are the best. I just so appreciate you taking time. I know you're busy not being busy, but kind of busy. <laughs> Yeah. And I appreciate that about you. <laughs> thanks, Rob. I, I, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it very yeah, much. Yeah, congrats on the book. It really is It really is fun to read. And there's a million nuggets of wisdom, as I like to call them, lead from the core. I want to show that one more time for our viewers on YouTube. And to all the viewers and listeners, as always, I'm so grateful for your time today. I know you're busy people. So listening is uh, listening to this, I do not take this. Um, uh, I take this to the heart. Let's just put it that way. And I wish you all much love and gratitude as always. Thank you so much. 